and uh, evaluate them as well based on how well the people know you. For those of you who have had them for a couple of days, or if you can just scan them, any patterns emerged? Did any of you get any help in identifying certain things that? Hello? Like what? What showed up? Were you surprised? Were you? What frequented that surprised you? What showed up frequently that did? Which? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, I think that uh, relates to you being uh, uh, communicative. You, you, you chat with people. Uh, at least I have found that. And people identify with that. Any other observations? We, we did have an outstanding observation. Brian shared with me that there's another closet amillennialist in the class. And uh, that's a great, great discovery. <laughs> <laughs> because why they're in <laughs> That's fun to do. Any other things that you observed? <laughs> that didn't show up, or it did? No, it did. It did? <laughs> Any of you discouraged? Well, you wouldn't say that by what didn't show up? Oh. <laughs> well, uh, do any of you need any paper? I, I brought way more than I needed for some reason. I don't know why. That's all. If anybody would like some paper, feel free. I'm not real nuts about carrying it around all day. OK, evaluate these uh, gifted things and uh, take advantage of it. I, I was sharing earlier that I also have a little theory about doing this in another area. Uh, at the end of the section, we have a how to get along in a church, uh, group dynamics and a look. How was my math so wrong? I figured a thousand, we, we needed, there's about 70 of you, that 70 times 70 is 4,900, right? And a half a page, we went over this in the lobby. How come I have that much more paper than I need? It's twice as much. I don't think so. Maybe that was it. Who knows? That's a lot of that But that's a lot over. I, I had to go. Okay. This is my uh, very unfavorite. What am I not doing right? There we go. This comes to be my most unfavorite section in the whole thing because it is so uh, personal. And uh, it, it, is, it, it so goes against the uh, way the world is going, and we've all been touched by that somewhat, that it, it makes it kind of awkward for, for a lot of us. Uh, but we need to do this. Oh, let me go over the grades with you for a moment. I just, here, here's how it broke down uh, as a class. From 90 to 100, there were 34 of you. From 80 to 89, eight. From 70 to 79, nine. Uh, below that, eight. Uh, so it's a very heavy upward curve, which is what I shoot for. Uh, appreciate your good work on that. It's 
As we enter into the uh, discussion on the role of men and women in the church, the distinctives and how genders function in the church, uh, we need to recognize that that is a hot button issue. Are you aware of that? There's all sorts of movement going in, in all levels of church life in this regard. Uh, it, it's reflected in every kind of church setting from the most liberal to the most conservative. There is movement that is going on. Uh, I have uh, experienced that uh, because most of that movement has taken place in my lifetime. Uh, dramatic changes. Uh, I made some of the changes myself. Uh, at the school, we, uh, when I came as a student, we had very strict rules on, uh, I didn't make them, I came under them, on, on dress code. Uh, girls could not wear slacks, period. Not, the fact of the matter is nobody wanted to because girls did not wear slacks much in those days. That, was, that would have been in the uh, late 50s. That's a long time ago. Uh, I came as the assistant dean in my second year. I became dean of education. We only had one dean and was that for 35 years. Uh, I've changed more rules than there are in the rule book right now. It's that simple. One of which was dress code. Uh, one of which was uh, when I came, it was against the rules for any girl to ride in a car alone with a guy at all, ever. And uh, that became a, uh, a non functioning possibility, you know. It, it just changed over those years. I remember uh, after we had observed uh, life in the church and in the home, uh, faculty in a faculty meeting, uh, I was directing, we decided to uh, change the rule on uh, wearing of slacks, pants, jeans for girls. And I caught a lot of flack for changing it. I remember the first graduation after we changed that rule, I had a number of parents objecting to that. One lady really got mad. I can remember the spot in Oak Park where she was she had biblical verses, it's wearing men's clothing from Leviticus and all sorts of things that were going on. And uh, that, that was a hard, hard move to make. Uh, a lot of constituency didn't like it. Uh, the way we made changes like that was, my viewpoint was, school is a less formal church place than church gathering and it could reflect the dress code of the uh, churches that we represented in a more casual way. And we tried to keep up with that. That's uh, been an overriding principle. That's why you can wear flip-flops at a certain time. And, and uh, uh, what, when's the rule when, what do they even call the shorts that are, I used to call them Bermudas, is that what it is? Yeah. What are they called now? I've gone through. Are they still? Is that what you can wear in the warmer? When's that start? April? April. April. Uh, we've tried to keep up with, with that kind of a thing. Not so much looking at what the world does, but what has been uh, acceptable dress in relationship to a local church where the church government has something to say about it. That was the philosophy. So we made some changes along that way, and uh, will continue to, no doubt. That, that's basically a procedure. I, I'm saying there have been some enormous changes over those years. Now, when it comes to church, uh, there have been enormous changes, too. Uh, and in, in that day, in the 50s, virtually all churches, the ladies would wear head coverings, and there was no vocal participation in any denominational church in any settings by the women. It was that simple. It was a universal practice. And between now and then, it has changed. It has changed ge geographically. Uh, in, in the assemblies, uh, if you would uh, 
start on the East Coast and go to the West Coast, you would notice a variation in the question of a head covering or a hat or a veil or whatever you want to call it. I refer to it as head covering. Uh, you would notice a variation. There would be far more wearing them in the East than in the Midwest and more in the Midwest than in the West. It uh, relates to casual society dimension, what degree of casualness there is. Uh, and that's, that's a moving thing. It still is. I would say within the next decade, uh, the question of head coverings will be discussed in a class, but not practiced in any church to speak of. That's the way it's going presently. And it will no doubt continue to go that way. Uh, in relationship to the vocal participation in church life, uh, there is that same kind of movement. If you start at the liberal churches, there's no, no restriction. Uh, Dow Seminary, uh, within my lifetime, within the last decade, uh, has started to receive uh, women to go into training, not to go into the pastor as such, because Dallas is, is training pastors primarily. But they have done that. And uh, that, that will continue. That practice continues and will become broader and broader. In relationship to the more conservative churches, uh, adjustments are being made as well. In the liberal churches, lots of lady pastors. In the more conservative ones, not quite. Associate pastors, that's happened. Uh, some are starting to serve in relationship to elder boards and other areas. It's a growing influence. You can be sure that's going to continue. It's one of the issues you guys are going to have to face in church life. In our assembly at ACC, we, we originally had one view amongst the elders in relationship to the role of women, particularly in the area of, of head coverings. That's changed presently. Uh, there's a mix in relationship to that on the, uh, amongst the elders, so you have a variation of practice. Uh, reflecting, again, the variation of practice that comes to us, uh, in, our, in the assemblies here, there's always a mix of students who uh, come from varying backgrounds where there are varying practices in relationship to the role of women. And we try to accommodate that without rancor and anger or all the rest of it. And, and we just, you know, accept what comes. There are positions that are held. I see movement uh, in relationship to our own assembly. As I said, and watch, I, I see movement amongst the ladies in relationship to head coverings. And it's getting less and less. Uh, the tendency now is to say only the Lord's Supper and uh, not any other time, those who were wearing them at all. And there's a, a change uh, over the years that is happening. I have a variation amongst the, the female population of my own family. Uh, I don't get involved in that. I think that's the husband's job to take care of that. Uh, some of them aren't taking care of it, but nonetheless, it is their job. And uh, that, that's where it stops. Uh, so there are variations. There's movement. And you have to decide where you're going to fight your battles in all of these things. Uh, right now, I'm more concerned with the vocal participation than I am with head coverings. I think the head covering seems a done deal. Uh, I have persuasions over that, which I will uh, share with you in my gentle way. Uh, well, I heard that. Uh, uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, some of the things aren't worth fighting over. Uh, we'll probably have to bleep that. Okay, because there are a lot of people think it is worth fighting over. Some people think it's the, the head covering's the third symbol, the bread, the cup, and the head covering. Yeah. But there it is. Uh, so there's movement, and, and that's why we have to talk about it. We want to at least be uh, influenced by Scripture, if not obedient to it. Now, I'll show you where we are. This is all the Bible says about the woman's role in the church. One page. Ten fun. Everything. This is all there is. That's not a bunch, is it? You think we could understand it. Here are two books, just two, that have been written. We use these in a uh, senior seminar. 500 pages each, written on this. That's a thousand pages trying to explain one page of scripture. 
This one says one thing altogether. This one says the opposite altogether. Now, I got a feeling that when scholars write so much about so little, they're trying to get out from under what it's saying. It can't mean what it's saying. And I am convinced that's the whole problem here. You can't be serious that there's a difference between the function of men and women in life. You can't tell me that they shouldn't be equal in the way they function in home and in church and in the secular world. That is a joke to think that's the case. That's the way the world comes at this. That there is a difference of role. Isn't that right? Isn't that what the world says? That's called egalitarianism, where you know there are no distinctions. There are no intellectual distinctions, no emotional distinctions, functional distinctions, role distinctions. That's archaic. Isn't that what you're taught in school? It really is. And the Bible comes along and says, no, no, that's not right. Woman was made for man, not man for the woman. You all agree with that, don't you? Do you all agree with that? Is it hard to say? That's what Paul says, inspired of God. That's the account of creation when man was alone. Woman complements, completes man. It's a helpmeet, suitable. The only suitable helpmeet. Oh, we just got a dog at the house. I gave a dog to the kids, to the in-house glocks at Christmas. A dog is man's best friend. No, he's not. What is man's best friend? His wife. What did I hear? TV. TV. That's about the case. <laughs> so we start on a whole different page than a secular world. We do not start with evolution. We start with the creation of man and woman, and we start with why woman was created. And then Paul will say, the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. God took a, a bone, a rib out of Adam's side and used that as the uh, basis for making woman. And he would say, you are flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. There's a closeness that is there. And then uh, you have numerous other statements, and we'll look at those particularly, to show that there is, uh, here comes the bad word, subordinate role of woman to man. It is subordinate in marriage. It is subordinate in the church. Now the passage that arises out of is 1 Corinthians 11, where you get this order structure that I have here. Understand there is a fourfold order involved, and this is critical to understand. Paul will say, there is God the Father, there is the Son, there is man, and there is woman. That is a subordinating role. This, the woman is subordinate to the man, the man is subordinate to the Son, and the Son is subordinate to God. There is subordination within the Trinity. In survey doctrine, when we talk about the Trinity, we emphasize this concept. Understand it is the core concept that we have to have in mind for, for this question of role. There is no, no question of inferiority between God the Father and God the Son. Our statement of the Trinity is that there is one only and true God, but in the unity of the Godhead there are three persons, the same in essence, sharing equally all the attributes of Godhood but distinct in subsistence, being God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Sharing equally all the attributes of Godhood, yet there is subordination 
Men and women share equally all the attributes of humanity, yet there is subordination. For functioning sake, it works best this way. The God who invented, who created us, gave us working instructions for the home and for church, and it works best that way. You would think he would know that, wouldn't you? In relationship to the man, out of 1 Timothy 5, the male is to be the provider for the family. That is the primary responsibility of a male. If a man does not provide for his household the material needs, Paul says he's worse than an infidel, worse than an unbeliever. Worse. In that same chapter, he says to the ladies, I will that the younger women marry bear children, rule the home. And that is the historic function of male and female in life. It's the way it usually has worked. But things changed. We're in an enormous part of that change. It is a... Uh, non-characteristic change that has taken place. It has taken place in my lifetime. The year I was born, Hitler invaded and the Germans invaded Poland. And the Second World War started, a horrible war. By the time I was six or seven, it was over. Hundreds of thousands, I don't even know, probably millions of men were killed in that war. In, uh, I was visiting with a German couple that were in Germany during the war, and uh, the lady was saying her entire village was minus any males at all, even teenage males. They had all gone off to the war and finally to the Western Front when they to the Eastern Front, Northern Front, when they went to uh, Russia and they died. Whole villages were minus men. In our country, uh, when I was 10, 12 years old, I had uh, four uncles fighting in various parts of the world. Uh, my one uncle was a Marine that was killed uh, at uh, Iwo Jima. Another was a in the Air Force, he was flying B-29s. A couple others in the European theater. It was war, it was terrible, and men of all nations are, were being slaughtered. And uh, there was an enormous call on materials. We got all upset about the, uh, the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Oil tankers were being sunk regularly in the Atlantic, taking supplies and fuel, and in the Pacific. I mean, spills that we made ourselves, civilized human beings blowing one another up. It was a terrible time. And uh, the, the, the destroyers that were being made were, were being sunk as fast as we could make them. The uh, factories in the United States were turning out a destroyer every month. That's kind of amazing. It'd be put in the water, man with sailors and out the sea and sunk. It was a terrible time. And we needed more help. And the lady said, we can do it. Who is this lady? Any of you know her name? Rosie the Riveter. That's right, Rosie the Viverder. And things changed because of this, folks. Enormous changes. Rosie made tanks. Hard to make a tank in a dress. Do you know that? Now, there were a lot of women who were working during these days. They were working particularly in three areas. Can you identify them? Nursing. What's that? Nursing. Nursing is one. What's the other? Teaching, secretary. 
That's the way it was. If you worked, you did one or two of those things. You could be involved in food services as well. But even then, that was mostly a male thing. But we needed Rosie. And Rosie came in in her, her work overalls and went to work. And she made the tanks and riveted and did all the things the men couldn't do because they're over there shooting bullets. And Rosie got busy doing all that. And she found out something. Slacks are comfortable. Okay? They were with us forevermore. And I can work. And this income's nice. And changes came. And uh, we're at the end of that right now. This all happened in my lifetime. I saw all this happen from normally stay-at-home moms, sending off their, their kids off to public schools, uh, doing the things of home, raising the children, dads will work, he comes home, meals all ready, sit down around the table, all the rest of it. When I was growing up, I used to get, my mom used to get me dressed every day for when my father would come home, get a whole new fresh, we all did that. It was a different world, altogether different world. And I've seen all this happen. Now, there's some enormous changes that impacted the church out of this. And we need to stop. We'll pick it up there next hour. Rosie the Riveter, know that name. You can thank her for slacks. <laughs>